uh, on the faculty uh, at um, over at University of Tennessee Chattanooga and the Department of uh, Computer Science and Engineering is also adjunct appointment with us in the Department of Medicine. Uh, he's interested in uh, uh, using probabilistic gene network modeling to study cellular aging and uh, has done a lot of work in uh, looking at the roles of uh, uh, mathematical models and uh, machine learning and he's going to speak to us about mathematical models and machine learning and biomedical research. So if you'd help me uh, welcome uh, Dr. Chen. Thank him for coming. The, the title is kind of really vague because the I was asked to give a topic maybe a two or three months ago. At that time, I don't know what to talk about, so I gave a vague topic, and then I had to stay with this topic. <laughs> so, uh, but in general, that's what I do. So, the, and I thought about what I should be talking about, and and there are some things uh, fairly recent. I'm uh, actually actively uh, uh, research on that, but then I shall. I should talk what I really know and avoid make a fool myself. <laughs> so, so this is basically uh, talking uh, my main research topic. So I, I have been asking for by many people, including my own parents, my own uh, children, what do I do? <laughs> and even recently, there is a administrator from the financing asked me, what do you do? Uh, my main research focus basically in a plain English, I, I figured out how can we live a longer and a healthy life, uh, mathematically speaking, I guess, <laughs> or computationally speaking. So uh, that's what I want to uh, figure out. Uh, in, in fact, if you really Google, it seems like uh, many people in the IT industry or like people from Google or PayPal, they are investing a, a lot how to live longer, like the Google Calico. It's a completely different subsidiary of the Google. <laughs> so uh, I know this because some of my, one of my mentors actually now work for that <laughs> Google Calico. So in a way, uh, I will show you all <laughs> this. <laughs> so uh, that's actually uh, the first one of the first thing I learned when I tried to uh, learn English or <laughs> watch TV series <laughs> in the U.S. Uh, so it's kind of a Life goes in a circle. Uh, okay, so let's first start with what I do. Uh, a very simple story, at least uh, from my perspective. So how how do we uh, study lifespan aging and figure out how to live longer? The first thing we I need to do, or at least from, uh, from research perspective, we need to have a mathematical model for aging, and then we can study how we can how, why some, in some situation uh, organisms have a shorter lifespan, in some situation we are living things can have a longer lifespan. And that's the main thing. We need to have a, a simple mathematical model. It turns out that this has uh, people, uh, maybe 150 years ago, they, uh, I was told that I need to cite all the sources of images. That's from the <laughs> comments. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, Maybe uh, in the 19th century, uh, Benjamin Gumpers actually studied uh, uh, life uh, the death, uh, calculate, estimate the life insurance for the, the British uh, population, and he came out with this model to estimate the aging. Basically, uh, uh, the S is the viability, and uh, this derivative <coughs> means viability goes down with time, which the chance of dying increasing. In, in our life, that's generally accepted. And since that's a negative number, we, we take a negative, we study a positive term. But then we also normalize by the uh, uh, viability itself. So it's a normalized declining rate of viability, and that's the mortality rate. Uh, so this is very intuitive definition of a mortality rate. I, if the if basically is a normalized chance of dying, if the normalized chance of dying of any species, including us, is increasing or uh, non-decreasing over time, that's aging. And it turns out not every organism or, or living species on this planet actually ages. Some spe species do not age. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the major uh, uh, publications from the Google Calico is to show some species doesn't 
has a mortality rate does not increase over time. Uh, well, one of that is this viruses, uh, and so people, uh, if you, if you look at this, if this is a constant mortality rate is a constant, and then the viability curve is a simple exponential decay, and there are other things we are familiar with, the simple exponential decay. That's the radioactive isotope. And we, the, the exponential decay basically means for any given population, we take, take that population after, say, half of the lifespan, you take that 100% population, it's exactly the same exponential decay. So a, a system, a non-aging system basically means the chance of dying today and the chance of dying yes, uh, uh, tomorrow and yesterday, they are the same. There's no difference. And that's viruses. Apparently, for uh, there's the um, a molar, molar a rat, molar rat in the underground, and they have a, a, a mortality rate very close to the constant. And there are also some uh, 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 living species in the water. I, I forgot, maybe some kind of spongy, or also very close to this, be because they have a very high uh, regenerative uh, system for this. So, no, but then, of course, unfortunately, not we human beings do not follow this pattern. <laughs> so, but then, why? Why some species have this non-aging characteristic, but we human beings, or mouse, or fruit fly, or worms, or even bacteria age? So basically, from virus to cellular organism, uh, the light aging goes from the uh, uh, non-increasing to the increasing. So, the, and so I actually use the Saccharomyces cerevisiae as a model to study cellular aging. Uh, it's the same species we use to make a beer or red wine. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of my uh, friends know a bit of Spanish, tells me uh, in Spanish, uh, Beer means service. <laughs> so, so basically, that's uh, the, we use that uh, to study aging. We use that to study the replicative aging, basically how many times the cell can divide. And because it's called budding yeast for a reason, so the, the large uh, cell is the, we call it a mother cell. And then over time, the mother cell will divide but give birth to a smaller cell, that's called a daughter cell. And then we can count how many times this single mother cell gave birth to a daughter cell. And then the, the number of offspring is something we call a replicative lifespan. There are also chronological lifespan of the E cell, and that's basically a measure of duration of cell in stationary phase. That's called calendar lifespan. That's basically how humans calculate our lifespan. But the replicative lifespan uh, is much easier to measure in experimentally. And so uh, as, as a research science, we argue the rep replicative lifespan of yeast is a model for dividing cell, like a stem cell aging. The chronological lifespan is a model for non-dividing cell, like a, a red blood cell or neurons. The red blood cell in our body, uh, as I understood, it, the after it's mature, generate, it has a limited uh, time span and just goes away without actually the nuclear genome. So that's how, at least when we write research proposals, that's how we argue about it. So, okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is actually how we measure the replicative lifespan of the E cell. And literally, uh, uh, when I was a postdoc, I uh, uh, had to do everything myself. I, uh, uh, sit in front of the microscope looking at the E cell, and after E cell divide, you, you see a single uh, a daughter cell, then I use a, a microscopic needle, move that daughter cell away, and then I count how many times this mother cell divided. So this is what, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I write down that this mother cell lived for six generation. That's the lifespan. And then we do this for uh, each experiment, we, each strain, we do it for 40 cells. And then you have a wild type treatment, a different strain, and then we plot it out for the experimental result. 
So, and then actually we fit with the mathematical model, the Gumpert's model, to quantify the aging process. And basically, uh, so well, you can see uh, the that paper published in 2006. Uh, I spent about one year doing the experiment and one year just to submit a manuscript. <laughs> uh, submit a revision, submit a revision, take a year to publish. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I did that work at the University of Rochester Medical School, uh, Center for Aging uh, at the time. Um, that center doesn't even exist anymore, so. <clears throat> okay, so we can, so basically I used the Gumpers model to, to quantify the yeast aging process. And now the, uh, so the Gumpers model is a two parameter model. The, the first parameter, this R0, uh, Basically means when T is zero, that's the R. So this is something we call the initial mortality rate. And it basically means how healthy the baby is at the time of birth, we intuitively. Uh, this parameter G, um, because the exponential component has no unit, that means the G must have a unit of one over time or then that by definition, that's the rate of speed. Something divided by time, that means how fast is the change. So we actually call that mortality rate, uh, rate of aging, uh, because it describes how fast our chance of dying increasing over time. So, and then by that definition, if G is zero, that means then our chance of dying will be a constant, not be wonderful. If our chance of dying going down, that would be even better. That means we can regenerate ourselves. <laughs> so, uh, and I think that's what some people at the Google try to do, <laughs> regenerate. So, okay, oh, that's a joke, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, well, with the yeast, uh, uh, because the yeast we can isolate uh, from different places, like Italy, China, uh, uh, U.S., Pennsylvania, you, you, we, we literally analyze all these the yeast uh, strains and we see, uh, you can't actually ignore the equation there, but <laughs> pay attention to the conclusion. And basically, I'm trying to say how much our lifespan is determined by our own genetic makeup. It turns out for yeast, it's only 22%, which is good news, right? How much, how long I can live, only 20% percent, about 22 percent determining my what I got from my mom and my dad. The rest of it all up to myself. <laughs> right. So this is actually good news, but it's also bad news, in, depending on how you interpret this. It turns out this is actually the same number when we do the ex experiment in Josephina, in worm, and in human too. In human, we can analyze the identical twins. Using the identical twin in human, we found out how the lifespan using identical twin is also the same. About 20 to 30 percent came from the genetic. The rest of it all so-called environmental factors. So, uh, <clears throat> for the yeast, also uh, yeast actually had a, the same size of genome as E. coli. Is uh, the first paper when we published basically say uh, the the uh, 5,000 genes functional and uh, at the, but it is a eukaryotic cell, has a mitochondria, and many of the genes is conserved between human, mouse, full fry, and the yeast. So it turned out even for yeast, we actually can delete every gene from yeast. We do a whole genome, sequ uh, whole genome screen for the deletion effect on lifespan. <coughs> it turned out uh, <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> For the 6,000 genes, we can, uh, <coughs> uh, only about 1,200 uh, are essential genes. Re remaining about 4,800, and in this paper, they actually did for almost 4,700 single gene deletion. And then just measure if we remove one gene, how long the each cell live. And it turned out that only about, uh, maybe a five or 10 percent when we remove those genes, the yeast cell live longer. Majority of those genes, when we remove it, the cell 
either have no detectable effect or have a short lifespan. It's actually understandable. Mo many of the things in, in our body probably are useful. When we remove it, we have bad health and have short life. And that's actually is understandable. But then there are some genes when we remove, the yeast cell actually have a longer lifespan. That's a bit counterintuitive. <laughs> so, but there are actually the reasons why that. <coughs> So, and it's also some paradox in aging. So I just show you aging, the lifespan determined about 70 to 80 percent by the so-called environmental factor. But let's say the lifespan actually has something called a universal demographic characteristic. The universal, if you are, a, uh, if you has taken a physics course or from the mass, that's what the uh, physician, uh, physic, uh, not physician, physicists, <laughs> uh, 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 a mathematician really look for the universal truth, the, the people looking for the universal laws. And apparently in aging or lifespan, there's something called stratular Moldovan correlation. It's basically the negative correlation between the two Gompert's coefficient. And that negative correlation was first reported uh, in human population and then people also see that in mouse, full fry, and I also reported that in the East. Uh, I'm proud to say I'm the first person to report that in the East <laughs> so, uh, because I did all the work. So, <coughs> uh, and my technician, so <laughs> at the time. So, so this is basically suggests there are some common principle in all this uh, aging process, right? So. If, if you think about it, you throw a dice, uh, if you play a Monopoly or with your friends, or your, uh, in my case, I often play it with my kids. I have thrown the dice very often. But that dice is basically, so if it's a fair dice, it's a multi-normal distribution. But if you throw a coin, dice is six choice. The coin is head and tail. These actually belong to the same random process, multi-normal distribution. So even though they are completely different things, but they follow the basic principle. What I'm trying to say is, well, we have uh, uh, aging in yeast, aging in human, aging in fruit fly, aging in mouse. They are all different species, but the, the, they follow the same statistical characteristic, which what I argue they are common principles behind all this aging process. That's why we, uh, at least, that's what my argument, that's what I'm arguing. And then I need to prove that is the case. I need to prove aging has some common principle in all the species which leads to this characteristic. This is basically my goal. And to do this, I come, so first I summarize, <coughs> aging is about 70 to 80 percent stochastic, basically random. And there's no single gene effect because in E cell we delete, uh, uh, there are 600 genes. We know many of them influence aging, but when we, not, not a single one of them is actually so called a causal of aging. But despite all this, there are universal characteristics which suggest a common principle. And so what I come out with a model <coughs> or a simple idea is say, I argue aging, at least at the cell level, is an emergent property of the network, of gene network. And that's actually, uh, I had this idea probably in uh, 2007 or 2009. I, uh, I had this idea for one or, uh, maybe a one or two years, I got nothing done, but then uh, all of a sudden, uh, when I was doing a sabbatical at uh, Fred Hutchinson at Seattle, one day I, I had this idea. It took me about two or three hours to write everything down on several pieces of paper. That's that's the that's how this project is done. So you think about how do I come out with a mathematical model of aging? And it turned out that in uh, in physics or in engineering, people had known <coughs> this latency for a long time, and this is actually. Um, in engineering, we call this reliability. It's actually come up during the Vietnam War when the U.S. Air Force tried to figure out how long the U.S. At that time, they had the heat-seeking missile. But over time, the accuracy of the missile goes down. And 
maybe that, uh, the, the U.S. Air Force doesn't want to fire a missile because flip a coin. <laughs> they want a high probability of the missile hit something. So they want the, 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 this is basically a reliability engineering. How do you maintain the accuracy of the function of something? <clears throat> That's a system engineering. And turns out that we know that for a long time, if we have a redundant component in a system, <clears throat> for example, this room has many light, but imagine we have a single light of, in this room. And that single light, has, just like the radioactive isotope, is non-aging. And then the chance of this room to start with a bad, in that sense, is basically exponential because that single light is this room, how long this room will, will, will be lighted. Okay, assuming that there is a fixed probability of that, let's say 1% uh, of the room when this is a light. Let's say now I give you two lights of this room, the identical light. Each light had a 1% chance of going uh, dark. So the initially this room to start will be 1% divided by two because I have two lights. Right, so it's going to be 0.5% of chance of this room to start. Now, well, if we have two light, sooner or later, one of the light will go start first. As soon as that first light goes out, we have a single light left. What's the chance of this room to start again? Become 1% again. Well, you think about it. Initially, we have a chance of dying at 0.5, and later on, over time, the chance of dying increased to 1%. That, by definition, is aging. So there, but that's basically a very simple idea of this aging model. Basically, we have a, a, the aging of the engineered system is the late, due to the latency of the redundant component. That's, uh, I guess I need to check picture, I have my time to. <coughs> So, well, if we have a, so basically if we have a single component, we have two components, then we have three and four, and then you can actually see the latency increasing. The, the dark line is always the single component, and then the two, three, four. And <clears throat> this actually was first uh, published in 2001. Uh, I was still a graduate student at that time. Actually, those two people uh, from University of Chicago, uh, at the time they already staff scientists, I was still a student. I actually saw their paper in a campus newspaper say, we figured out how we can live longer. <laughs> so at that time, I, I didn't even know I was going to read this paper again and again for almost 20 years now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyhow, <clears throat> so the basic idea is aging is an emerging property of system. Even though every component is non-aging, but the system will still age. So basically, what, what I'm trying to argue is aging is the emerging property. That means not single gene is, will cause that aging. But as a whole, the system will behave like an aging system. Well, this is engineering, and that's actually pretty far from biology. In engineering, oh, uh, I, I messed up my animation. <laughs> In engineering, like a, <clears throat> a single component, a single engine airplane, a twin engine airplane, and a four-engine airplane, and in fact, uh, I Google even found out the recent uh, uh, airplane has ten engines because they want to <laughs> do a drone with it. Uh, but biology actually that, that doesn't work that way. In our uh, body, we, well, we have two years, but many other than that, many of those genes in our body is a single copy. Uh, there are some copy number variation, but that's actually not a major source. So this is actually a gene network of the E-cell I worked on. I actually generate that figure myself, so copyright by myself. That's <laughs> OK, <laughs> this figure too. So, <clears throat> but my idea is, uh, in biology, there's really no simple redundancy. And it, so we actually cause something a robustness, basically, because we don't know how it works. We, it's robust. But it's not just simple redundancies. And, if you Google, uh, ch check the definition of robust, it's also kind of vague. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so my goal is, instead of using uh, engineering, uh, like a circle, circle design to model aging, I need to use the gene network to model aging. And this is, uh, that's actually Ibrahim Voigt uh, from uh, Georgia Tech, uh, <clears throat> a person I talked to when I first come up with the idea. And 
He basically say, well, the key of modeling any uh, biology is how to model the phenotype. In this case, the phenotype of aging is death. How do we model the death from the gene network? <coughs> this is how I model death. Uh, this is something that took me one or uh, 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 probably two years to come up. <laughs> so so <coughs> in each cell, there are essential genes, and there are also non-essential genes. So the black means the essential gene, and the white means non-essential gene. Uh, essential gene means if, if we essential gene almost like the uh, something like the uh, ribosome uh, replication or protein translation or tRNA. If we remove those genes, basically the cell die and we die. Those are the essential genes. The non-essential gene and about the 4800, uh, that means uh, 600, almost 90% uh, of the genome are non-essential. In a sense, we remove it, we still live. Doesn't mean we are healthy, we just live. Those are the non-essential genes. So, <clears throat> and then I model all those, the uh, interaction between essential gene and non-essential essential gene. I model that with the exponential function, non-aging characteristic. And then over time, they will, the interaction will die out. And when the essential gene loses all of its interaction, and then the cell dies. And that's how I model the phenotype of death. And then in the east, that's a, and mathematically, that's actually equivalent to the circular design. So there are four links on the left, and there are four blocks on the right. That's, uh, so by this, by this design, I converted the entire reliability uh, principle back to the gene network, and that's all I did. <laughs> so, uh, by 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 doing this conversion, I can use, uh, I can read all those books and books of reliability statistics and use those engineering principle applied to the gene network principle to study aging. So I'm very happy with this idea. <laughs> so, yeah. but then. We have just single gene. What if we have multiple genes? I know we can just have model multiple essential genes, and that actually will be a serial design of circular block. Now the problem of this, this actually is not a biological aging. That's actually something called a machine aging. So, um, to the to most people, they probably don't really care about uh, the different mode of aging. But machine aging actually follow a different principle. It's something called a power principle. It's something called a Weibull model of aging. The biological aging, uh, the, the time is at the exponential term. The machine aging, the time is at the, the base of the exponential term. So there are different modes of aging. The biological aging actually increases much faster exponential term. So the re and then the reason is why. And on the, on the, on the one hand, uh, on your left, you see those machines that people are manufacturing cars. On the right, those are the uh, uh, children's side. Actually, that's from UTC website. I guess it's okay to use. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> what do you think the difference between the machines and us? And you kind of look around this room and then try to think about all the iPhones you bought. What's the main difference? The machines, they are homogeneous. Humans, we are all different. That's the main difference. Human, in fact, even for identical twins, everyone is different. The, the parents can clearly tell the difference. So that's really the key, at least from my understanding. The m machines, they are designed to be homogeneous. Uh, everyone has the so-called uh, 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 the same uh, uh, experience of using. If you, if someone has a car with uh, four wheels, the other car has five wheel or six wheel, that probably problematic. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the humans, everyone look around and they are all have different characteristics. So, but how do I model the heterogeneous mathematically? I just add a random noise. <laughs> so so it's, it's a way to model heterogeneous. So we model the something called a stochastic uh, uh, interaction in genes, and that gives the biological aging. So I'm going to just skip all this. But basically, that's uh, <coughs> the so-called heterogeneity in biology, I think, is really a key part of life. And uh, without the, 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 the random noise in the life of, I guess, random noise from the mathematical point.
I mean, people don't really think they live life randomly <laughs> for some purpose, but we can model it randomly. So uh, we, we use, uh, basically use a, a, a binomial to model this stochastic interaction, but that's actually, it come out with the biological aging. In fact, I can even write down analytically. Uh, so the K is the strength of gene interaction, P is the probability of the random interaction, and N is the number of uh, what's the number of the links per essential gene. M is the total number of essential. I can write down all those things and do the estimation based on experimental data. It's all good, but then I send it, uh, I send it to a journalist and say, well, you need to fit with the experimental data to show how it works. That's affair, and it took me another two years to do the experiment. <laughs> so, so, okay, so that's a biological aging model, and then I get all those experiments, and then fit the, the data, now I, I can show how the model works. <laughs> so the main conclusion that all those, uh, uh, those are different uh, uh, mutants from the East, what those mutant means, they are just different uh, mimics or model for calorie restriction. It turns out that uh, the, well, the main conclusion is the calorie restriction in, increase lifespan by increasing the reliability of gene interaction in yeast, at least. So this is the <coughs> uh, fab one is actually limiting the glucose intake of yeast cell. So we remove that gene, it actually uh, limit the glucose intake of yeast cell, and the yeast cell will live a longer lifespan. And, uh, I fit my model to this mutant, I show the, the reliability of gene interaction increase, but the natural topology doesn't change. And then uh, HEXA2 is a glucose transporter. We remove that, it's also mimicking the calo limiting the calorie intake for the E cell, that also increases lifespan. And SIR2 is something called chromosome silencing, and we remove that actually uh, shorten lifespan. I show that uh, uh, we remove that gene is actually decrease the gene reliability. But so to overexpression extend the lifespan. In fact, the people now uh, uh, trying to sell uh, compound mimicking the SIR2 inhibition to increase lifespan. It's the uh, analog of the resveratrol from the red one. But you need to drink like a 20 or 30 bottle of red wine to get the right dose. <laughs> but people sell the compound, but the compound unfortunately couldn't pass the FDA uh, clinical trial because they did it for five years. There's no statistical difference between placebo and the treatment. <laughs> so they kind of sell it as the nutrient supplement. <laughs> so it's actually very expensive, a $40 a bottle or something. <laughs> but People are trying to, SIR2 overexpression is known to increase lifespan in uh, yeast cell, fruit fly, Drosophila, and mouse. It actually shows in mouse, it actually uh, uh, decreases the likelihood of many age-related uh, disease. Uh, so, so I think that the new, the new uh, branding of the company is trying to sell that uh, compound, not as the lifespan increasing, but just as the uh, uh, kind of a, uh, drug to decrease the chance of some specific disease. That, that's my understanding. That, that's, a, uh, that's not my business. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> okay, um, so I'm going to quickly, uh, that's what I may work to. And then I'm going to talk some other things which may show uh, the good possibility of collaboration since we are just literally a stone uh, okay. uh, if you have strong arm, I can throw a stone to the engineering building. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so this is basically how many of the engineering view the health issue. So we basically, uh, if, if we are healthy, maybe we are in a physiologically unhealthy state, we can convert, pull ourselves back into a healthy state. And some disease like a virus, well, there's a new virus just come out in the far east, <laughs> will pull us from a healthy state into the unhealthy state. And if we stay there for long enough, maybe we just won't even exist anymore, the system. That's basically the engineering view of this. And in fact, uh, I'm not the first one. This is actually from other people's idea. And in engineering, we basically design a system with all this parameter. We have the initial state and the final state. If we can pull a system from any state, that's called controllable. If you drive a car, 
uh, with all-wheel drive, why do we want to? Because it's giving you more control on, uh, on some icy condition. That's called controllability. Uh, we can apply, so we have the network model. I have the aging. I can apply the same thing from aging and the disease. So that's called, it turns out the, this actually, uh, uh, I probably should remove this. <laughs> so this is actually all linear algebra. And if you, if you have children or something, they are trying to do a math. There are good reasons because they can help uh, improve human health. I guess <laughs> at least I believe so. Uh, it's all uh, we can just apply linear algebra and uh, analyze the natural and see how how things will work. Uh, so I actually did that for the East network, and it turned out that for the all our gene network, our gene network is actually had a very wide range of controllability depending on the noise. And the, the noise basically the position. Um, so the that actually shows the number of a node I need to control. So at the very high position level, and you, you see the actually almost go down to zero, it's actually one. That means our, we can precisely control everything. If we really control to the 10 to the minus 30th position. But unfortunately, that's not how life works. <laughs> so, and so if we really uh, uh, move the noise level up, at a certain level, we need to control everything in life. And so basically, that, I think that's probably closer to one. It's uh, uh, depend on how I model the noise level. So what I'm, this is actually a very recent work. I actually did that probably a few months ago uh, using R. <laughs> so, and, but then how do I, uh, then what I need to do is I remove every gene from the East gene network and then still uh, uh, apply this noise and then compare with the experimental result of lifespan, see whether controllability and the lifespan actually indeed has some correlation or not. So that's one work I'm doing. I'm actually aiming this for NIH R1. So, <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> okay, okay, that's actually one of the work I'm doing. So, and it turned out uh, this is actually published by a big name in the field. And people apply this controllability analysis in a human and trying to identify the drugs. And in the drug design, and machine learning, AI, and drug design is a big thing. People start a company from that. Uh, but any drug, if they target a gene, it has to be targeting something called a driver node. Because if the, if the node in the network cannot control the, the state of the system, it cannot be a therapeutic target. Because by definition, a, ther a, ther a treatment, you need to take the system from an unhealthy state to a different state. If the principle shows the target you are addressing cannot do that in principle, that shouldn't be started with. Right? So basically, we, we, we apply this principle to show what, at least in principle, should be targeting what we shouldn't target it. That's why identify the drug target is the big deal in uh, at least, I know there's a lot of companies that like this. So that's, uh, that's uh, other people, but I want to apply this in terms of to disease, to aging. Basically, what's the, what's the best intervention if you uh, uh, target the gene actually can alter lifespan. So uh, my lab also applied deep learning uh, to a, a, a different type of uh, uh, data. So we now also apply the data to the microscopic image of the uh, uh, east cell dividing and then try to infer lifespan automatically. Uh, we are still far from that because the, the currently we have R square like a 5% or something. <laughs> so, but it's actually still a, a small step with giant leap for us, I guess. <laughs> so, and that's actually a, a thesis project of a student of mine. And basically, we convert all those the, uh, time series microscopic image, we convert that into trap image, and then convert that into a, a, a family tree. And based on the tree, we infer the lifespan. That's the Mirrors the thesis project. And some, uh, we also apply network permutation to mo monitor change during aging. And this change means the expression level of protein in E cell. And what we did is, that because in E cell, we can measure the protein level at a different li uh, lifespan. So we can measure the, say, uh, 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 young cell, old cell, and different hours. 
And then we see the noise level uh, increasing over time. But you, you see also the error, but what, what, even though the noise level in the gene network increasing over time, but the cell is able to inhibit this level compared to random expectation. So you see the error uh, initially actually in the body of the noise, but when cell become older and older, you see the error move to the left. That means the cell is able to inhibit the noise compared to random chance, which is really amazing. So we, our body as an engineering system works much better than the Apple iPhone, those things. <laughs> this iPhone just cannot do this kind of thing. Yeah. So we are amazing engines in a way. But what our, we also did this for calorie restriction. It turned out that calorie restriction treated cell, they show the same characteristic of the old cell. So basically, if we eat healthy or eat less calorie, we are able to suppress those noise just as those long-lived cells. That's actually the bottom uh, figure. And the, the basic idea is noisy increasing during aging, but dietary restriction and long-lived cell, uh, we are able to suppress those noise. That's the uh, uh, Dr. Harbour Gross uh, result. And we also apply this to many other uh, permutation tests for the, the a genomic data or association study, but I just skipped that. So I recently, well, since we are so close, uh, recently Charles was trying to apply uh, 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 deep learning uh, modeling to some uh, uh, electronic health record. And I'm very lucky Dr. Patrick Ku also interested in this. And hopefully some of you also interested in this. And if you think about it, I, I recently learned Healthcare is like 19.2% uh, of GDP, and healthcare is the is a section in the GDP which hasn't been revolutionized so-called by the AI or deep learning. So, <laughs> so there's actually a lot of potential to this. Uh, at least uh, people who start a company argue that way. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's basically uh, what I have. And, and of course, I need to acknowledge the people who gave me money for doing this. <laughs> so it is. Okay, so uh, uh, I hope it's uh, useful in some way. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the yeah. interesting talk. I had a, I had a couple of questions. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, the first one is, is um, I think the understanding of these gene-gene interactions uh -huh has really changed quite a bit. I know since I went to medical school 30 years ago, right, <laughs> one gene, one protein doesn't really work. Oh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of interaction with the non-coding part of the, oh, of the yes. DNA. Right, right, yeah. you know, Could that be some of the noise in your uh, system? Excellent. So we don't have to, the so-called gene is just a mathematical symbol. It could be anything. It, it, it doesn't have to be a protein coding gene. It's, it's just, anything functional in the cell. But we have to give it a name somehow. Yeah, so. Is there any correlate between some of your findings and things like DNA methylation that oh. cor correlate with aging and also correlate with, uh, uh. you know, actually even are even are inheritable, right? Yeah. I mean, so there, the famine data from Quebec shows that yeah, yeah, DNA yeah, methylation yeah. and then yeah. it gets provided and have different health outcomes in, in children born from that, so it changes, it changes this. I wonder if that reflects your work at all. Uh, those are actually all about human, you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, it's really hard to get this data from human, but for East, we do, I do have a collaborator from the Baylor College of Medicine, and in fact, his entire lab is working on the methylation part. The, 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 this gene SIR2 is part of that pathway. In medical school, we're taught to conceptualize aging as a function of telomere length and oh. telomere shortening. Mm -hmm. uh, can you comment on that in the setting of sort of your gene network? It, because it, in our mind, it uh -huh. is a space and time, something that gets cut off over time to, yeah, yeah. to yeah. an essential component of the, gene, of the gene itself, and then the gene dies. Right. Uh, uh, well, the telomere, 